Okay, we still have a few folks coming in, but we are going to go ahead and get started. My name is Dana Rhodes. I am the state plant regulatory official for Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the Spotted Lanternfly Summit for 2023. Um, we are certainly happy that you were all able to join us. We have over 500 registered for each day. So that tells us that the topic is important to you all. We have changed the format just a little bit. Um, we are doing trying to have a little bit more uh, participating from you. Um, so as we go forward, uh, we will um, be asking some questions. You will see some polls pop up. So please make sure that you are participating um, as those things arrive for you. I would like to thank um, a, a lot of people are coming together to put this on for you. So I want to give a shout out. We have the agenda committee. Um, and there were several people that were a part of that agenda planning committee, uh, many from uh, states across the US. Uh, we have Scott Shermer from Illinois, Joy Goforth from North Carolina, Chris Logue from New York. Um, David Giannano from Virginia. We have David Pegos from California. We have Megan Abraham from Indiana. And so again, you know, these are the folks that came together to put topics, um, determine the research topics, and also regulatory topics. I'd also like to thank um, Morgan Dube and Eric Bittinger, who are our facilitators this morning. Um, we are certainly glad to have them. They come through the National Plant Board Facilitation Committee. So thank you both for joining us and taking on this role. We're certainly glad to have you. Brian Eschenhauer certainly plays a large part in the proceedings of today. He has been a part of this since we have been virtual uh, beginning in the, the great year of 2020. Uh, 2021, actually. 2020 was the last face-to-face -face meeting that we had for Spotted Lantern Fly. So Brian, certainly appreciate all you have contributed to us, um, as well as Jacob, um, Jerry, and Kevin, who are on staff. Uh, they are the behind the scenes guys that make sure that we don't have technical problems, or if we do, they get them solved very, very quickly. Um, Cornell is a great partner is, in this, as well as the Northeast IPM program um, setting up and actually hosting the event, taping the events, uh, making transcripts, which all takes a lot of time. Um, and folks, this is a volunteer unit. Um, this, is, this is not a paid professional group um, that gets hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. So um, truly appreciate all the time and energy that are given um, by everybody who is on the agenda committee, as well as our facilitators and behind the scenes folks. We did let you all know that if you had wanted to catch up on um, past year's Spotted Lanternfly Summits or the Spotted Lanternfly 101 recordings, that you could go to stopslf.org and look under reports and presentations and you will find all previous recordings there. <clears throat> so again, you can, um, these will be recorded and again, they will be placed at that location and that is www.stopslf.org. So please feel free to go there and there's lots of other information there for you as well. Okay. My partner in crime today, as we are going through and doing panelist discussions is gonna be uh, Scott Shermer from Illinois. He is a SPRO there. Um, so if you are putting questions in the Q&A, uh, and it is for the panelists, please indicate so, so that we can make sure that um, we include that as we are moving forward during our panel discussion time that we have set aside. Again, we're looking for questions. We're looking for um, you sharing information concerns that maybe were not addressed by a speaker. Uh, so just make sure that you're putting that in the Q&A and the chat, because as Eric and Morgan will be monitoring that, so will Scott and I. All right. Well, again, thank you all very much. I'm looking forward to all the topics and the speakers. And so we are going to get started with our first session on SLF research. And Greg Para 
is the session later for that. Greg, are you on? Yes, I am. Thanks, Dana. I believe uh, Dr. Laura Nixon is on. Are you on, Laura? And she's a, a postdoctoral researcher at the USDA ARS Curtisville, West Virginia Research Station. Okay, grand. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be kicking this off today. Um, so I'm going to be speaking today about sort of three or four years worth of work that we've been doing here at the Lefty Lab at the USDA ARS in West Virginia. Um, and this is a group of studies looking at the host suitability of temperate, wild and cultivated host plants for spotted lanternfly. Um, so I'm going to be doing kind of a quick fire go through, um, just rounding up what we've been working on um, under this subject. Um, so the first set of studies that I'm going to speak about today were performed in our quarantine greenhouse space in Fort Detrick, Maryland. So when we started working on spotted lanternfly, um, the insect wasn't present in our state or county, and we were predominantly working with it in Winchester, Virginia, um, but we did have quarantine greenhouse space available to us in Fort Detrick, Maryland. So we would take our plants and our insects to this quarantine space in order to do rearing studies. My slides are a bit slow to change for some reason today. Okay, um, so I'm going to start talking by talking about a study that we've actually already published, looking at the survivorship of spotted lanternfly on um, tree hosts for a two-week period. So we looked at these 10 tree species that are reported as SLS feeding hosts, and that are common in our region here in sort of West Virginia, Northern Virginia, Maryland area. Um, so basically, we set up cages with each of these individual trees in, and then we introduced different life stages of SLF into them. So we assessed early instars, which are first and seconds, late instars, which are third and fourths, and then adults. So uh, these are the results of how many, uh, what percentage of each of those insects survived after the two week period. Um, so our main takeaways from this were that, as you can see here, nymphs survive on a broader host range than adults do. Uh, this lines up with a lot of other knowledge that we already have. Um, but also um, late instars have a broader survivorship on these um, host plants than adults do, but slightly lower than the early instar nymphs. And as far as adult survivorship goes, we actually only had um, surviving insects at the end of two weeks on Tree of Heaven and then just a few on Black Locust. Um, something worth noting here is that for the nymphal instars, um, Black Walnut actually supported really high nymphal survivorship, but did not support any adult survivorship over this two week period. So, um, in a study the following year, we did the same experiment, but actually looking at the survival of spotted lanternfly on what we're calling viney hosts for two weeks. Um, so the plant species that we evaluated here were muscadine grapes, um, cascade hops, and hardy kiwi. And then we also had um, cages of tree of heaven to act as our controls um, to make sure that all the insects were surviving okay in this greenhouse setting. Um, so life stages evaluated this time around were the early instars, again, the late instars, and then we actually split adults up into early adults, so those pre positional skinny adults, um, and the late adults, so these kind of fat yellow adults that we're assuming are now ovipositing. So the survivorship after two weeks on these hosts, um, you can see that nymphs and those early season adults can survive on all of these specialty vine crops. Um, hops are actually a really good host for early instar nymphs specifically. Um, and these late season adults did not survive on any of these viney hosts alone. They only survived on the tree of heaven. Um, anyone that's worked directly with these different life stages, um, we've kind of come to see that late um, season adults are a little bit wimpy. They do die quite easily when you're handling them and putting them in cages. So then we took this a step further um, to look at the full survivorship and development of spotted lanternfly on a variety of host diets. So we started off by looking at their survivorship and development on single and mixed host diets. 
So he introduced 30 newly hatched SLF into cages that contain two potted plants of either tree of heaven alone, black walnut, apple, peach, or grape, or tree of heaven mixed with one of these other hosts. And then we tracked their survivorship and development until adulthood or until they die. So again, these findings have already been published in 2022. So the main findings from this survivorship and developed was that peach, apple, and grape alone did not support development of adults. However, the asterisk, asterisk next to that grape is that this was Vicus rotundifolia, um, which is a muscadine grape. Um, black walnut alone did support the quickest development to adults, but the adults only survived for less than 10 days. Um, and the mixed diets that had Tree of Heaven with them supported the quickest development and adult survivorship overall, um, which kind of tells us that a mixed host diet would be beneficial for these insects. So we then went on to look at spotted lanternfly development on diets that didn't include Tree of Heaven. So here we chose to use grape and black walnut as the sort of primary host in these diets. Um, so for this, we actually moved over to a different grape species. So we were looking at Vitis vinifera here, um, which is um, a wine grape, and we were looking specifically at Riesling grapes, because um, we had noticed some difference in survivorship with some preliminary studies between grape species. So we had two sets of diets here. We had the grape diets. This was grape alone, grape and trees of heaven, with silver maple, apple, peach, and then grape and black walnut. And the same for black walnut diets, black walnut alone, with tree of heaven, silver maple, apple, and peach. And again, we introduced newly hatched nymphs into these and tracked their survivorship and development throughout. Um, so this is a little bit of a, of a full on graph because this has got all of our treatments on. Um, this has actually been accepted for publication in Frontiers in Insect Science. This will be available online really soon. Um, so basically all of the treatments except for grape with peach support, supported development through to adults. Um, the Riesling grape alone and the tree of, and Riesling grape with Tree of Heaven supported the longest adult survivorship. Um, so this is really different from what we saw with those muscadine grapes. Um, black walnut diets once again supported the quickest development to adults, but these adults did not survive very long. So that little um, group um, of lines right here, those are the black walnut diets that didn't have grape or Tree of Heaven in them. Um, and as mentioned, the the survivorship on Riesling was really different than Muscadine. So this led us to wanting to look at the differences in suitability amongst grape species and cultivars. So um, since in these separate experiments, we saw this big difference, uh, we set up another greenhouse survivorship and development trial, same setup, introducing 30 early and start, um, newly hatched nymphs into the cages and tracking their survivorship and development all the way through. Um, but in these cages, we just had single diets, no mixing. Um, so we had two Vitis vinifera um, diets, one Chardonnay and one Pinot Noir. We had Vitis riparia, which is a wild grape, which is uh, a wild grape species commonly found in this region. Uh, we had Vitis labrusca, the Concord grapes, and we have that muscadine grape in again. And once again, we had Tree of Heaven as a control. Um, so this is the survivorship curve for these. Um, of these diets, you can see that the um, muscadine grapevine, which is this green line right here, uh, did not support survivorship through to adults, but all of the Vitis vinifera and wild grape um, species and also the Labrusca did support development through to adults. Um, those wine grapes and wild grapes supported the best development in survivorship. Um, and there was a significant difference in survivorship between the two vinifera varieties, which was really interesting. Um, and with that, we actually still have one bug standing from this experiment. So uh, this guy is, and this photo was taken on Monday morning. Um, he was hatched from eggs laid in October or November of 2021. He hatched in May 2022, and he has been surviving on Pinot Noir grapes um, since then. Um, so this is a very interesting outlier, and he is a male. Um, so we're still technically tracking this data, um, but this is also being prepared for um, publication just as soon as this guy drops off. So I'm now going to quickly go over some field trials that we've been doing in Winchester, Virginia over uh, this time. So looking at the same batch of hosts, 
to see how acceptable these hosts are in the field for spotted lanternfly. So I did these semi-field trials um, where I evaluated tree of heaven, black walnut, apple, riesling grape, and peaches. So we had single potted plants and we popped them under these uh, shade cloth tents that we constructed. Um, this is because we tend to see a lot of the large wild populations and aggregations are in more shaded areas. Um, so we fluorescently marked 15 SLS of early and stars, late and stars and adults. We chilled them and released them at the base of each plant. We then counted the number of SLS present on each plant for one, two, four, six and 24 hours to look at um, using retention on the plant as kind of a proxy for suitability. Um, so these are results from the this acceptability um, trial. So looking at the early instars here on the far left, um, the largest number of early instars were retained on Grape and Tree of Heaven. Um, for late instars, the largest numbers were retained on Tree of Heaven and Black Walnut. And then adults go back to that same pattern as early instars being retained on Grape and Tree of Heaven. It's also worth mentioning these are early tree of positional adults. We then repeated this trial in a very similar way, but we had double sized shade cloth tents and we basically put one of these hosts plus a tree of heaven under the same tent one meters apart. We marked 15 SLS diff two different colors and released them at the bottom of each plant. We then tracked the retention and switching at one, two, four, six and 24 hours. And once again, we evaluated the early stars, late in stars and adults. Um, so looking at the movement of each uh, life stage between these two host plants, for early instars, they were more likely to um, switch from black walnut to tree of heaven in this pairing. For both apple and peach, they were most likely to switch from their tree of heaven to the fruit tree. Um, and then there were no significant differences in movement between the tree of heaven and the grapevine. For late instars, um, we saw the opposite for Tree of Heaven and Black Walnut. They were more likely to move from Tree of Heaven to Black Walnut and from the Tree of Heaven to Fruit Trees with no significant differences on the grapevine. And then, then adults, there was actually no significant difference in movement between most of these pairs, except that they moved away from the Black Walnut in significantly higher numbers towards the Tree of Heaven. Um, we also put out sentinel potted plants um, of Tree of Heaven, Reason, Grape, Peach, Apple and Black Walnut at um, different infested SLF sites. And we basically just went and counted um, which SLF, how many SLF were present and which instars um, on each of these plants on a weekly basis. Um, our main findings from this were that season long SLF were found in the highest numbers on Tree of Heaven, which isn't very surprising. Um, but then that period of time when late instar notes are most prevalent, the highest numbers were found on Black Walnut. Um, and SLF were very infrequently observed on the great apple and peach plants. So very quickly going through the key takeaways of this, um, Tree of Heaven is both a preferred and suitable host, but not obligate for development. Um, we of course already um, knew this to a certain extent from those um, UE et al studies coming out of, of Kelly Hoover's lab. Um, but it is, it is interesting to see that they can develop on certain species of grape alone and black walnut, which is really common in our area. Of the hosts evaluated, spotted lambs and fly can develop to adults on tree of heaven, black walnut, and those big, uh, uh, grape species that I mentioned, except for that muscadine grape. Um, and overall, black walnut is a suitable host for nymphal life stages um, and a preferred host for the late instars but the adults don't seem to really use it as a preferred host necessarily. Um, grapevine is a preferred host of early instars and adults um, as compared to the, the black walnut. Um, and there is a significant difference in host suitability between grape species and the varieties and cultivars, um, which is really interesting in my worth digging into what they're getting out of each kind of grape. Um, and going back to those two-week survivorships that I spoke about in the beginning, it appears that hops and kiwi could become crops of concern. And apple and peach are likely not crops of concern, although it is worth noting we have done some studies with um, forced feeding of SLF on apples and peaches. Um, and when peaches have high numbers of SLF feeding on them, it does affect the growth and cold hardiness of the peach. 
Um, so I'd like to thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions either now or in the chat. I know that was a quick run through of quite a few studies. Um, and this has sort of spanned a few years. So this is our lab group through the years. Thank you to the Lefty Lab and all our funding. All right, thanks, Laura. That was really great. I, I didn't know if um, you were able to read the questions in the Q and A, um, or did you want me to go through them? I can't see them when I have my screen. Okay. Oh, that's fine. There's uh, the one. Quite, there's three that I see. The one is uh, based on the results of these two studies. Do you think that conclusions support the removal of the lampus would negatively impact the development of SLF across all life stages? Um, I mean, that's hard to tell in the field. They definitely can utilize other hosts. Um, I think removal could help the like slow down the growth of the populations, but it's it's sort of hard to tell, it, you know, it's not very cut and dry, um, and it very much depends what secondary hosts you have present in that region as well. Like here, they could very easily be pushed off onto wild grape and black walnut, for example. Okay, and the next one is, um, will you do more trials with maples in the future? It seems like uh, they like to lay eggs on maples. So, um, yeah, we definitely found a lot of eggs on, especially silver maple with that like shaggy bark. Um, we, in this very specific region where I am, we haven't seen like the very, very high numbers and high feeding on maples as much as people in Pennsylvania seem to have. Um, so that might, like, I don't think we're going to do more trials with maple in our lab, but I'm sure people in Pennsylvania and further north might be more interested in that. Okay. And are there any studies looking at fecundity based on host species? We haven't gone that far. So we do get some eggs laid in these um, uh, in these studies. And we do also keep the females and um, working with Julie Urban, we sort of dissect them and look at their reproductive organs. Um, and what we found is rather than being a pattern on which host they were on is basically like the SLF that lives the longest or the most sexually mature um, and most likely to be mated. So um, we actually haven't seen, obviously if they live longer on a host, you're more likely to see them um, become sexually mature. So it was more of a time thing rather than necessarily on certain hosts. Okay. And uh, do you think the stage or age of the trees have an impact on feeding or survival? Yeah, I'm sure they do. So in our greenhouse studies, these are obviously our cages are like um, three foot tall, four foot tall. Um, so we're obviously using relatively small plants compared to like, uh, you know, Kelly Hoover's lab did the, the big field cages with bigger trees. Um, so I'm sure those bigger trees have a lot more in them for the insects. Also, we have to swap our plants out really regularly to keep them going um, when we're in the greenhouse. Um, so I'm sure those more mature okay. trees would be more beneficial for the insects. Okay, I'll, I'll just go through two more then. That's all I see in here. But um, yeah, then we can move on. To, uh, I, I can stop sharing because then I could probably see them. Then. Oh, that's okay. Uh, being a suitable host means that the plant is at risk of mortality or merely reduced growth. Um, so when I say suitable host, I am talking about the insect rather than the plant. Um, so the hosts that I deem are suitable are ones that the insects choose to be on in field settings um, and also actually support their survivorship and development um, in everything that I've discussed today. Okay, and uh, this will be the last one. Then. So based on your studies, does this mean that SLF can't reach reproductive adulthood without a lampus to feed on? So another way to put this is, if SLF can't feed on a lampus, are they able to lay eggs? Um, so we've had, um, so those, specifically those um, great single grape brewing studies that the one that's still ongoing in our greenhouse, um, some of those have laid eggs. Um, and when we dissect them, we have found some to be um, um, reproductively mature. So, and then also like the, the UE papers show that they actually can reproduce without our lampus present. Okay. All right, thanks, Laura. And there might be some others that are coming up. It looks like there's a right. few more. I'll, I'll keep an eye on them. Thank you. Yes, uh, Tracy was helping out also on there. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you.
All right. So now, uh, Bill, you're on now, right? I, I am. Yes. Okay. We'll Sorry about the confusion. And that's okay. We'll go on to uh, Dr. Phil Lewis then next. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. And I uh, guess we're back on track, a little mixed up here for our session. Um, so I'm going to present on some of the work we've been doing the last few years, uh, looking at field treatments for lanternfly egg masses and also um, some nymphs using a soybean oil product. And for the second part of uh, the talk here, um, be presented by Emily Wallace. She's my technician that works out in Pennsylvania, and she'll be sharing some uh, exciting results that we got um, setting out some traps for lanternfly egg masses. So let me get into our work with this uh, product called Golden Pest Spray Oil. It's a 93% soybean oil product. It's um, certified for organic growers. And there's a specific um, section of the label that allows for spot treatments of gypsy moth egg masses as well as spotted lanternfly egg masses in a one-to-one -one mix. And that comes in handy when we have to do, say, regulatory treatments for that Christmas tree that you see there um, or these uh, large masses, uh, clusters of egg masses that, that you see. Uh, for instance, if, if scraping is maybe not a viable option or desirable, especially with rough bark um, trees like this one, where you know scraping might not you might not get all of it, but it'd be nice to have a product that you can use to treat. So, like I said, it's been several years we've been working on this. So this is a report, internal report that was written up in 2019 from our laboratory, and these were the results from that, um, looking at some conventional insecticides and the impact on hatch of the egg masses. And you can see that the golden pest oil. Here, uh, we got quite good results, you know, more than 95% control. Um, this is another horticultural oil, but that label only allowed a 7% um, uh, formulation mixture. Um, but you can see we, we got quite good results compared to the conventional ones. And so then we wanted to take this out to the field and let um, some of our uh, spotted lanternfly field crews put this out. And so we developed a data monitoring tool so that they could go to a plot, uh, set up the experiment, have treated and untreated egg masses, and then be able to return to those. And you can see that uh, push pins where we have individual egg masses that are identified on a tree, those could, that were then revisited back post hatch in, in say June or, uh, or so, May or June, depending on the location. And then we could do assessments as far as how much of the, what percentage of the eggs hatched out of those masses. Uh, so again, this is a one-to-one -one mixture and it's just a simple spray application, either with a backpack sprayer, a handheld sprayer, or you can see here the little hand pump sprayer. Uh, we did this for two seasons and had over 3000 egg masses that we looked at and four different states participated both years. So results, and you can see for the egg masses, it's quite easy to, to look at in egg mass. You can see this is called an operculum. And so it's a little uh, flap or door that opens up when they, they hatch. And you can see and count ones that have hatched and, and emerged. And so what I want to show you here in this graph, let me explain it a little bit. So this is for the two years of the study. Um, the, the red hue is the lighter hue is the untreated. Uh, and the red darker color is the treated. And same thing for the following year in the green hues, we had the lighter is untreated and then treated as a darker green hue. And the primary effect, and so what we did was we just classified this by percentage hatch. So between zero hatch up to 100% hatch, most of the time you get full hatch out of these egg masses or almost full hatch. Uh, primary effects of the treatments you can see here uh, for both years is that it greatly increased the time or the instances where we had zero hatch. So from 23% up to almost 70% that year. Following year, there weren't as many um, in the control group that um, didn't hatch out, but it also increased, uh, treatments greatly increased the amount of egg masses that did not hatch. And also on the other end, you can see that it greatly reduces the amount of um, large hatch events. So to summarize then our, our results from the two years of field data, uh, putting it out with uh, 
applicators from four different states. We had, um, you can see uh, flashing back then to that, that uh, previous graph that we had up to that first year in 2021, we had up to 70% of the egg masses as a result of treatment and, and no hatch. Overall, we saw a hatch reduction for the two years of between 73 and a little over 80 percent. Uh, when I did my um, field testing for, for myself, just small scale testing, um, which you saw in the previous graph too, we had between you know 92 to 98 um, percent. Sometimes we have upper 90, upper 80 percent hatch on uh, the small scale testing that I did. Um, we also looked at different times of the year. So we can put these treatments out after um, egg laying is done, say December. And then we also tested in say early April or even May, right before hatch. And it's just as effective, on, doesn't matter the time of year. The restriction is on the label is that the, the air temperature has to be above 40 degrees. And that's for just uh, for the product itself to be able to, to work effectively. Those could be put out on warm days in the winter time, as long as it's above 40 that day, they can, can be put out. Uh, what we did notice in the first year of the study is we had the um, field crews take pictures of the egg masses when they went to assess them post hatch. And one thing that was not captured in the data was, and that we noticed from the pictures is that we had quite a bit of degradation. So the treatment actually, um, causes the integrity of the egg mass to fall apart and you get those eggs um, just kind of sloughing off and you can see that in these pictures here. So I think that's some of the discrepancy that you see in my small scale field testing um, when I would do several hundred egg masses uh, per season compared to what the field crews were seeing. Uh, another use of the gypso, we tested it at horticultural oil rates, which is you can see here a 2% mixture or a 3% mixture. And uh, that's on the label as well to be used as insect control. And you can see for, for both, you can see there's a good initial knockdown and then some recovery after one hour, but after 24 hours, we still had, uh, for the 3%, we still had up to 80% mortality um, for those insects. So that's, it's, I think it's a, a good option for um, use of a horticultural oil uh, versus conventional insecticides. Um, there might be sensitive spots or areas near water that uh, you could still put out a treatment using this product. So let me hand it over to Emily. Let me stop sharing my screen so she can. And then I think we can just hold off on questions. I'll, I can reply to some questions um, in the Q&A, but Emily, why don't you go ahead and start sharing your portion? Uh, while she's working on that, Emily, can you, you, you might be muted. Uh, are you able to share your screen? Um, let me just answer some questions while she's working on that. Maybe um, Jacob can help her. Um, question from Jacob about would it be possible to scale these treatments for entire trees and phytotoxicity concerns? So this for the 50-50 mix, it's really a for a spot treatment. Uh, it's just really not practical to spray down a whole tree with that percentage of product. I think it's been tried and uh, just is not practical. Uh, what concentration of golden oil required to reduce hatch significantly? That was the mixture. It's a one-to-one -one mixture with water as a spot treatment. Uh, the rest I'll, I'll answer uh, by typing, but go ahead, Emily. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think you're good, Emily. Okay, great. All right. Good morning, everybody. As Phil mentioned, uh, my name is Emily, and I am with the Forest Pest Methods Laboratory, and I'm based out of Easton, Pennsylvania. And today I'm going to be presenting my team's research on SLF overposition trapping. So the purpose of this study was to entice the lanternflies to lay eggs on traps to aid the egg mass collection. 
Collecting egg masses in the field pose numerous challenges. Finding areas with a decent amount of masses to collect may be difficult. Properties that allow chiseling is limited. Collecting the masses usually requires chiseling them from the bark of trees, which leaves a small scar on the bark, and that's not very aesthetically pleasing. Egg masses that are laid higher in the canopy can be very difficult or even dangerous to harvest. So these traps are meant to ease the egg mass harvesting process by attracting egg mass laying on reachable and cuttable material. These traps can serve as tools for population detection and assessments, and also for population mitigation by concentrating the egg masses and subsequently destroying them before they hatch out. Over the last five years, we tested numerous materials in search for a successful oviposition trap. So here in 2018, we started to use some burlap with a different design on it. And we also used a fake bark material. And in 2018, we, we found 34 egg masses on the material that we set out. Moving along to 2019, we added more materials to the arsenal here. We tested materials with and without a burlap covering, including 18 gauge metal sheets and half pipes that we rusted because you know we've seen egg masses on rusty metal. So we said, hey, let's set it out and see what happens. We also set out some cellulose fiber, some landscaping fabric. We, we even made some tube hotels for them out of cardboard and ductwork. Um, we set 200 objects across eight sites, but it only resulted in 31 egg masses being laid on all of the material in a completely random manner with no noted preferences. So in 2020, we decided to switch it up and we created a triangu triangular prism trap, which tested three different uh, substrate materials, gaffing tape, cork, and roofing material. So we fastened these materials on the outside of this trap in either full sheets or in layers of strips. And half of them had a covering and half of them did not have a covering. Um, in 2020, we also tested these traps at three positions on the tree, at the base, right around DBH, and at around 10 meters. We set out 156 of these triangle traps and at three study sites, However, only seven egg masses were observed on the surfaces. Um, we, we noticed that some of the egg masses were actually laid on the inside where we had folded the material over to secure it. So with that in mind, in 2021, we said, okay, let's continue to try using this triangular prism trap, but instead put the material facing inwards. So that's what we did. And we tested in 2021 only cork and roofing material with and without coverings. And we tested two uh, positions on the tree at DBH and at the base. So out of the 144 traps that we deployed this year, we got 326 egg masses laid and most of the egg, egg masses were laid on traps that had covers. There was no statistical difference in egg laying between positioning at base or DBH. Um, so, you know, we found out, okay, they preferred the cover traps and um, it didn't really matter where we put the traps, but unfortunately it was still, very, it was low, three to five egg masses per trap. So we took all of our previous findings into consideration that led us to our final trap design in 2022 that we've named the lampshade traps. So we fastened the roofing material around the trunk of a tree. We use a ring of batting material at the top to help cushion the insects because we, know, we all know that spider lantern flies love to crawl up. So it cushions the insects and prevents them from getting stuck and dying. And the batting material also helps flare out the outer roofing material portion that has the asphalt facing inwards and resembles a lampshade. We only tested our traps on trees of heaven for the study. We tested smaller trees, first larger trees, and we tested horizontally oriented traps on fallen trees, 
versus vertically oriented traps on living trees. The traps were normally placed right around DBH um, for ease of taking care of. So um, if there was any inconsistencies in the bark, um, you know, we would move it up or down. Depending. So here is a map of our study sites here. We had six sites spanning five different PA counties. And we also used uh, us one site in Northern Delaware. And we had 105 total traps deployed and they were set out between September 21st and October 20th. Our data suggests that the lampshade trap is an effective oviposition trap for SLF egg masses. A total of 1,943 egg masses were present on 105 traps, 95.5% of which were on the vertically oriented traps. So you can see this graph here, the blue bars represent average egg masses on the vertical traps per site, and the orange bars represent the average amount of egg masses on the horizontally oriented traps. And you can see that the, uh, they, per, they highly preferred vertically oriented traps. And the average number of egg masses per trap was as low as 9.6 here, the Easton site. Um, but two of the six study sites yielded averages of 47.1 and 54.4 masses per trap. And three individual traps captured 98, 102, and 111 egg masses. Although not statistically significant, traps placed on trees between six and eight inches in diameter averaged the most SLF egg masses per trapping area. So trees of this size can be selected for routine trapping of egg masses with the assurance that egg mass yield will be high and the cost of the materials will not be excessive. Lampshade traps can be placed on larger diameter trees, but it will result in higher costs and a greater effort as more material becomes just excessively cumbersome to work with. Here's a breakdown of the egg mass data found on and around vertically oriented traps by site. So I know there's a lot going on here, so just bear with me for a moment. So this fourth column here shows the same information as the first bar graph I showed, the average egg masses per trap at each site that were vertically oriented. So what we did is we took those numbers and converted it to average egg masses per surface area of trap and of the survey areas. So if you take a look here, adjacent means it's the egg masses that we counted above and below the traps. And we chose similar sized trees and counted egg masses up to three meters on our control trees. So the average number of egg masses by trap area in square feet ranged from 2.2 to 11.6 compared to surveys adjacent to the traps above and below and on control trees that averaged only 0.03 to 0.25 egg masses per square foot. So this data shows that they highly concentrated their egg masses in our traps as opposed to near the trap or on other trees of similar size in the immediate vicinity. So here are some images of some deconstructed lampshade traps. We did know a significant amount of mold present on the egg masses at most of the study sites. So if the egg masses are to be used for research, this can most likely be mitigated by keeping rainwater from entering the top of the trap by stapling and draping a small strip of tarp above and over the trap. Um, and there are also some mold inhibitors that might, be, that might help if you spray it up and into the trap if, there, if there's wet and humid conditions. Um, this research has been submitted to SLF Special Topics in Frontiers in Insect Science, and we also have a two-page PDF document detailing LST construction and, mater and the materials list that you need, um, and it should be uh, shared in the chat momentarily here. And uh, we want to thank, thank, thank you to the S&T and PPQ folks who helped us with the field work for the study. 
And we also thank PennDOT and various PA Delaware landowners for the use of the land and the trees, trees of heaven. And then I'll end with a photo of an SLF laying eggs inside one of our traps. <laughs> so thank you everybody for listening and we're happy to answer any more questions that you have. Okay, thanks Emily. I know Phil was busy answering questions in the Q&A, but uh, does anybody have any specific questions about the egg mass trap? I'll keep an eye on the questions and answers. Greg, are you was... able to upload the, the how-to two-page document? Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to work on that. Okay. So there, there was one other question from uh, Mike Hutchinson, Phil. Uh, when it's when assessing the uh, effectiveness of golden pest foil, do the operculums of the eggs from which nymphs have emerged always pop off, or do they sometimes stay on like a flap and lay back down over the hole? So does yeah, yeah, I have not seen that happen. You know, once they they move out of that 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 lid or the door just just falls off, or it, it will stay on its hinge and stay open, but then with weathering and stuff, those will eventually get get pushed off. But uh, if we're running short on time, I can just uh, answer these by typing. Uh, we're 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 good right now. Um, and when did you? Uh, this is probably for both you and Emily. When did you deploy the lampshade traps? Was it the end of the summer? And how long have they been left out? So we deployed the traps uh, between September twenty first and on October twentieth. Um, so. And we and we collected them in late December, early January, and you know by the twentieth of October they're already laying. So you know we probably could have even got more overposition if we set them out a little bit earlier. But you know with our schedule and everything, that's what we could fit in. And with the help, you know we needed some help, so it we chose these dates for that. So. Okay. And um, about how much time and people is it required to set up one of these traps on a mid-sized tree? I would say maybe four to five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's good to have two people just to help hold and work together. Okay. And for the uh, the document that Greg's going to share, there's a a list of products to buy and where to where to get them. So we have everything pretty much outlined in that document. How to? All right. I don't see any more questions coming up. There might be still some more coming up. So just keep an eye on the on the questions and answers uh, for both uh, you, Phil and Emily. But thanks. I appreciate it. So we'll move on to our next presenter. I know everything's a little off track from the agenda, but we probably might get back on track after the break coming up. Uh, so the next presenter would be Dr. Flor E. Acevedo, uh, who's an assistant professor at Penn State University. I know you've been waiting patiently, Flor, so you know, whenever you're ready to go. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so today I'll be presenting a research about life history traits of a spider lanternfly when feeding on grapevines and tree of heaven. So in this study, we had two main research questions. The first one was whether spotted lanternflies were able to complete their development when feeding exclusively on cultivated grape. And the second question was whether spotted lanternfly feeding on either single diets of grape or and tree of heaven or the mixed diet would um, be developing slower or would that affect their survival or if that type of diet would affect their reproduction. So to answer these research questions, we set up um, this experiment. So we first collected egg masses 
uh, the old way. Now we know that there is a better way to collect egg masses. Um, so we collected egg masses from the field and then we put these in emerging cages. We, I call these ones nymph emerging cages. And those cages had tree of heaven and grape on them. And we just let the, the, the nymphs hatch. And when the nymphs emerge, we place them into the treatment cages containing either Concord grape, tree of heaven plants, or the combination of Concord grape and tree of heaven. So in each of these cages containing these plants, we put five names per cage. Now, when these names became adults, we made pairs of males and females coming from the same plant treatments and then placed those couples in cages with the same type of plant or combination of plants in which they develop. This experiment was set up in field conditions in Southeast Pennsylvania, specifically in Albortes, Pennsylvania. So these are our cages containing the different treatments and they were arranged in a complete randomized design in the field site. And we put some wheel barrier underneath to prevent the sort of to control a little bit the humidity and to prevent weeds from going into the treatment cages. So in all cages, we measure the development and the survival of nymphs. And when these nymphs became adults, then we measure the survival, the oviposition of those adults. And as the adults became, uh, as they were dying, then we collected those bodies and we also collected them. We, we dried them in an oven and registered the dry weight to figure out if there was any correlation between the weight gain of adults based on the type of diet they were grown. Also in our research site, we record uh, temperature, humidity, rainfall, data uh, using a portable weather station. Using the temperature data and previous data of spider lantern flight development, we calculated the growing degree days for each instar. And we used the base temperatures that were developed by Kriegman and colleagues in 2021. And for adults, we used the base temperature uh, reported by Smyers. To calculate differences in adult dry weight, we standardize the weight of each adult um, by dividing their weight uh, to the number of growing degree days that they accumulated when they were alive. Okay, so these are our results of development. And these are names. So the figure to the left shows that names fed on Concord, which is this, this box here. They require greater number of growing degree days to develop, followed by those fed on Tree of Heaven. And then the ones that require the less number of growing degree days were those fed on Concord and Tree of Heaven. So this is growing degree days. And then when we look at days, we found a similar pattern. So this table, um, here we have the treatments and what it's showing us is that the nymphs that were feeding on the mixed diet of Concord and Tree of Heaven develop faster than those fed on either Tree of Heaven or Concord Grape alone. So these results show that um, the spider lanternfly develops faster when feeding on the mixed diet of Concord and Tree of Heaven compared with the other um, diets. Um, when they were when they were exposed to single diets of tree of grape or tree of heaven alone. In terms of survival, 
our results were similar. Spider lanternfly nymphs had higher survival when they fed on the mixed diet of Concord grape and tree of heaven than when they fed on tree of heaven or Concord grape alone. The survival probability curves that we have here in these graphs reaffirm this. So basically what we can see here is that um, when the nymphs fed on tree of heaven and the mixed diet, which are these bars up here, then the survival probability rate was higher than 80%. But when they were feeding on Concord, then the survival declined dramatically over time. So what about reproduction? The reproduction of lanternflies was also affected by diet. Females lay more eggs when they fed on the mixed diet of grape and tree of heaven than when they fed on the single host diets. And also the hatch rate was slightly higher or much higher, I should say, when they were fed on uh, the mixed diets than in the other treatments. So notice that lanternflies fed from early instar nymphs to adult food, they did lay eggs feeding exclusively when feeding exclusively on Concord grape. We were able to get one egg mass with 45 eggs. However, those didn't hatch. So we did have very low egg hatch rate in our experiments. And that could have been due to storage conditions of the eggs or due to, sorry, or due to um, conditions of low humidity in the greenhouse when we put them out in the spring. So it could have been experimentally, it could have been, you know, um, things that happen in our experimental conditions. So we also look at the number of days and calculated the number of growing degree days that took that females took to start laying eggs from the time they became adults. Under our experimental conditions, it took 30 to 50 days for those females to start laying eggs, which is a pretty good amount of time. Um, so this suggests that treating adults early in the season before they start laying eggs is likely the best time to do it because it's going to reduce future populations. So we don't know exactly what will be the pre position time um, after they mate because we pair these adults as soon as they um, we could as soon as soon as they hatch. So we but we don't really know when they mate. The body weight of adult lanternflies was also affected by diet. Females gain more weight. So here we have the females, here we have the males. Females gain more weight when fed on the mixed diet of Concord and Tree of Heaven than when they fed on either Concord or Tree of Heaven alone. And males, sort of a similar trend, they gain more weight when they fed on Concord and Tree of Heaven than when they fed on the single host diets. To the right, we have a picture of two females with the same growing degree days. So these are comparable. And what we can see is that the size is about the same. Like if we measure from head to, to bottom, the size is about the same, but there was a significant difference in the, in the size of the abdomen. So the abdomen of the females fed on the mixed diet here was way larger than those compared, than that compares to females uh, fed on, in this case, three of heaven. So the insect really um, gain much weight, much more weight when they feed on the, on the mixed diet. Okay, so our summary from um, our results. 
uh, in response to our first research question of whether a spider lanternfly is able to complete the development when feeding exclusively on cultivated grape, the answer is yes. So this confirms, actually, uh, Dr. Ninskson um, confirms also this uh, finding. So they do, they can develop definitely, and they lay eggs when feeding exclusively, in this case, in Concord grape. But they did have high mortality and the reproduction was very low. In response to our second question, whether uh, single diets or mixed diets affect spider lanternfly development, survival, and reproduction, our results indicate that yes, this is the case. So lanternfly have faster development on the mixed diet. They also have higher survival and they lay more eggs when they had access to um, Tree of Heaven. And in this case, when they were grown in the mixed diet. Okay, so what do we conclude from uh, this work? Uh, spider lanternfly development, survival, reproduction, and body mass seems to benefit from having access to a mixed diet with Tree of Heaven. And um, this suggests that spider lanternfly management in vineyards could also benefit from limiting access to Tree of Heaven because that might help reduce insect fitness. So for our results are already published. They have been recently published in an open access journal for those who might be interested in looking at them. Um, it is in Frontiers in Insect Science. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my master student, Erika Laviega, who did these experiments. And also thank you very much to the group of people that either help with the experiments or provide technical advice to this work. Special thanks to Emily Shua Kamer and her family for letting us conduct these experiments at their farm. And many thanks to the funding agencies, the College of Ag, the Pennsylvania Wine Marketing and Research Board, and um, other uh, funds that we got to um, do this research. And to you, thank you very much. And if you have questions, I should be able to address them. All right, thank you, Flor. Yeah, I'm looking right now to see if there's any questions. I just see one right now, but I'm sure there'll probably be some others that come up. But um, it was just a question related to the, the images that you were showing of the adults, uh, you know, molting, or like they're molting out of the third instar, but this might have been, you know, fourth molting out of the third. But so they were just asking if they were seeing that correctly with the, the image you had of the okay, let what me was coming out of the third as to what, you know, if that was a fourth or was not an adult. Okay, let's see. So this one? Yeah, I'm thinking that's the one they're they're talking about. I believe so. I, I believe they are molting into four instead. However, uh, I can't be certain because at first they are very pale and then they gain color, similar to the adults. So you can see here, they are pale and then they gain color. So it seemed to be, that they were molting into their fourth instar, but I can't be sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. I don't see any others coming up right now, but um, there might be some more. That come up. Oh, there's a couple more, sorry. Uh, do you think the same SLF development you found on Concord could be uh, with other varieties of, of grapes? So based on uh, Dr. Nixon's research that was presented a few, a few uh, minutes ago, it looks like there is some differences in the cultivars. We have also observed that, but we are not as ready to publish as, as they are. Uh, it seems like um, Concord grape is a little bit more resistant to lanternfly than other Vitis vinifera cultivars. As far as we know so far, again, we are beginning to work on it. Okay, thanks. Uh... Does the climate affect the development of the grapevine? Or how does the climate, sorry, how does the climate affect the development of the grapevine? 
well, especially, I mean, weather is very important for um, plant growth. Um, it, it, it is complicated when there is a lot of humidity because uh, grapes can become sick, especially when we are working with Vitis vinifera. So that's something that sort of complicates these types of experiments because we do need to keep the plants healthy. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have my, my screen reduced down too far. They were asking about the climate affect the development on the grape vines. And so I'm guessing they're asking about the, how does the climate affect the development of SLF on the grape vines? Oh, how does the climate? Well, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure it has an effect. I'm pretty sure if we will do these experiments in other climatic conditions, we will get something different. Uh, what we did was just to record what we had uh, in the in the field site, because we were not able to control these conditions anywhere. We were working in the field, so definitely weather will have a, an effect of spider lanternfly development. Yes, absolutely. And did you take into consideration favoritism of certain tree of heaven and what reason for that is when doing research with SLA? They were talking about that question, that, you know, or observations come up before where sometimes it appears that they definitely prefer a certain tree of heaven over others. We did it because we, so why did we use tree of heaven? We use it because um, we know spider lanternfly loves the plant. And because we wanted to know how important it would be to remove a tree of heaven as a diet source in, in vineyards or close to vineyards. So it did have a management um, importance to, for us to know that. Okay. And we did not look at whether they preferred to feed for longer in tree of heaven or to stay in three of heaven plants when they were combined with grape. That was not part of um, a research question. And we did have too many cages to look at and very few people. So we were not able to look at that. Great. Thank you. There was a question about the laboratory setting. I think I have it. Did you have okay. any success reading in a laboratory setting? Yeah. And the answer is I haven't tried because um, not all Pennsylvania, I mean, Pennsylvania has been under quarantine, but not all the counties. So the county in which I am oh, okay. located, we are not under quarantine yet. So I don't have a lab facility in other counties to look at this. So I have not tried reading lanternflies in a lab yet. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, my name is Roberto Regalado. I wanted to ask a question about uh, rearing. So I have a uh, I have a colony that I'm rearing here in New York State in, in the laboratory, and um, we're trying to feed them different plant species. So we tried uh, we have potted tree of heaven, of course, but we tried uh, basil and uh, cucumber. And my question is, um, I guess, on the on the grapes. Um, I'm trying to kind of determine where exactly they like to feed on the grapes um, because I, I suspect that they might concentrate on the cucumber vines. Um, and so I'm, I was just curious if when you when you rear them in your uh, field study there, if the uh, nymphs tend to congregate on the vines or not. Okay, so it does change. When they are little, the, the young nymphs, they prefer to, need to feed on the new growth the young tissue, the underside of the leaves, the, the leaf veins. But when they start growing, when they become a little larger and they change instar, then they can be found more into the, into the canes, into the trunk. So they do change where they feed depending on uh, their development. Um, what I have seen is that sort of to have them grow better you need to change yeah. their diet as they as they grow so for example for young nymphs definitely cucumber strawberries three of heaven and if you want to put a grape in there i would use vitis vinifera so cabernet franc riesling something yeah. like that and then uh, later on you can take out the cucumber plants the strawberries because they will prefer to feed on more woody tissue and you can put maple in there or yeah. you know other other other, but keep three of heaven. It does what 
um, you want. I mean, if that's the purpose is just reading them, then I would definitely keep Trio Heaven all the way along and just add okay. other hosts as needed. Okay. All right. Sure. All right. Thank you, Flora. Okay. Uh, see, there's one more question. Um, will the nymphs do damage to the great plants before becoming adult? Uh, if they, I mean, they feed on them. Um, whether they completely damage the plant, no, they didn't. Um, we didn't have enough density. I mean, the density wasn't high enough, I believe, to severely affect the plant. We didn't see the plants severely depleted um, with the densities that we had. We only had five names per plant. So just take it for what it is. Higher density is my. Okay. Thank you for. Yeah, well, there still might be some other questions coming up. So just keep an eye on the questions and answers. Okay. I'll do that in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm.